Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Malin. I teach a class called CS50 at Harvard, which is our introductory course in computer science for majors and non-majors. Uh, the slides that I'm about to share with you can live at this URL, cs50.ly slash AI4. And if you've missed that at this point, just turn to the person next to you. Uh, but what I thought I'd share with you is a bit about how we uh, in, within CS50 at Harvard have been really steering into AI, particularly as recently as the past few months, most recently beta testing some of the ideas and some of the experiments I'm about to share with you with our most recent summer school students, which literally wrapped this past Friday. So all of this is hot off the press. So this is CS50 at Harvard. Um, in healthy times, at least, um, when we have about 700 students on campus, undergraduates and graduate students taking the class. Uh, it's a fairly traditionally structured class in that we have lectures with me once a week in which we introduce the course's concepts. And then we have sections or recitations with the course's teaching fellows or TFs who lead review and Q&A and dive into the material more deeply. Um, all of the course, though, is freely available and has been for the past 16 years as open courseware, so to speak, whereby all of the lectures, the videos, the audio files, the PDFs, the assessments, the software, literally everything, technologically and curricularly, has been freely available to anyone around the world at that URL, youtube.com slash CS50, and also via platforms like edX, if familiar, which are platforms for massive open online courses like at edX.org slash CS50, which is to say that we have quite a few students both on campus and off. In fact, in terms of this course's demographics, um, there are indeed about 700 students at Harvard College being a residential uh, university. We uh, are fortunate to have quite a bit of support structure in the way of humans. So some 40 teaching fellows who lead those sections, grade work, answer questions, hold office hours, and also another 40 CAs, as we call them, course assistants, who only lead office hours, working with students one-on-one. -on -one. We also have 200 students through Harvard's Extension School, which is our continuing education program, both in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and online. And also, curiously, about 300 students at Yale University, where the course has been offered in collaboration with our colleagues there as well. Uh, there, we have about the same ratio, too. But on YouTube, nowadays, there's some 1.5 million subscribers, folks who are engaging in some sense with the class, even if they're not necessarily submitting all of the work, and through edX, uh, roughly 5 million registrants over the past few years, which is to say at any given time, we might have hundreds of students literally on campus, especially nearing a deadline, asking questions, trying to write code, solve bugs, um, and online in a given uh, period, it might be 40,000 active students at any one time. So support structure has been at forefront of mind for us for quite some time. And being computer scientists, we've tried to address the need for a support structure through software. So for years, we've given students now a command line tool, if familiar, where you can type textual commands and get automatic responses from the computer called Check50, which is a tool that all students can use on campus and off to check the correctness of their code automatically before they actually submit it before the deadline. We give them a tool called Style50, which allows them to automatically assess the quality of formatting, the style, the aesthetics of their code. So if you're not a computer person per se, it's the analog of uh, writing like an English essay and capitalizing words properly, indenting your paragraphs and so forth, sort of nicely formatting things is style in the world of code. So both of these tools students can use to sort of teach themselves and get iterative feedback on the work that they're doing behind, uh, before a deadline. But we also more technically have given them a tool called Debug50, which actually just opens up automatically an industry standard debugger special software that just helps programmers find mistakes in code. And this just makes it a little easier for them to pull up that user interface to dive into troubleshooting some problems that they have. But I dare say it hasn't been enough. And so over the years too, we've embraced something that programmers call rubber duck debugging. Uh, so the idea is you take literally a rubber duck or really any inanimate object, you keep it on your desk next to your laptop or desktop, and when you have some logical problem with your code, the problem that you're trying to solve, we encourage students literally to talk to the rubber duck, and the idea is, and there's a whole Wikipedia article on this, the idea is that in talking through the process verbally in the absence of a TA, a teacher, a friend, a family member, you eventually, odds are, hear some illogic in your state, in your thought process, and ah, the proverbial light bulb goes off and you sort of appreciate where it is you've gone wrong. So for the past couple of years, we've had a virtual version of this. This is a screenshot of what's called an extension or a plugin and an industry standard tool called VS Code from Microsoft, which lots of programs included for the class. And if students were, up until 2022, to ask this duck for help, akin to the physical rubber duck, uh, all they would get back is three, two, or one random numbers of quacks. 
so not exactly AI. Um, but over the past few months, literally, really a few weeks into 2023, have we really been focusing on trying to bring this duck to life, so to speak, so that not only do they have this physical incarnation, at least on campus, but also a duck that talks back to them in English and to some extent in other human languages as well. So this was in large part motivated for us not only by a desire to provide students ultimately, as you'll see, with all the more of a support structure, but also to try to reframe the narrative that at least we have seen in higher education in K-12 over the past few months, which has been very negative. A lot of fears, understandably, around plagiarism and using ChatGPT and the like to just do your homework for you. I mean, we within CS50, and dare say introductory computer science classes for years, for decades, have been sort of wrestling with academic dishonesty, plagiarism, copying someone else's code in person or online, for years, and so they say this isn't really a new problem, and I do think that tools like ChatGPT are poised to exacerbate the problem, because you can do it a little more easily, a little more anonymously, without actually making a friend or a classmate complicit, but it's not really a new problem. And I did really think the opportunity is to focus on the more positive opportunities here, which would be not only the, what the tools can do, but also weaving, as in our case, all the more of a conversation around ethics and academic honesty into the process and academic integrity, insofar as these tools aren't going anywhere, and we're already pretty close to the point where you have this subject matter expert, at least in some domains, next to you as you're writing your code, as you're writing your essays, or solving some problems. So I'd like to propose that there's some really exciting opportunities ahead that even we have gotten a taste of, I think, in our own microcosm of CS50 itself. So what have we done on that front, and what are the tools we've been working on. So this is the language we had in our summer school syllabus over the past few weeks, whereby we deem it by policy disallowed to use ChatGPT, the new version of Bing, GitHub Copilot, and similar tools on the premise that they're just too helpful right now. At least out of the box, they're not really configurable. They pretty much try to not only just finish your thought for you, but hand you your second and your third thought as well, trying to do the work for you, which is wonderful for productivity, certainly in an industry context, and frankly, probably in higher level classes where you just want to solve problems more quickly after you've developed some muscle memory and some fundamentals yourself. So this is language we now have in our syllabus, but we supplement it with this language as well, that we consider it now reasonable for our students, at least, to use our own AI-based tools built on top of platforms like OpenAI and uh, Azure and Bing and the like in the coming months. So what does this mean in real terms for us? So these are some of our works in progress. And I thought I'd give you a tour via screenshots and URLs of what it is we've been thinking about. Our use cases absolutely skew a bit more toward programming and computer science. But ultimately, I'd like to make the claim that I think a lot of what we've been thinking about, a lot of what we've been experimenting with, is certainly generalizable, not just to other STEM fields, but even non-STEM in the humanities, arts, and beyond. So explain highlighted lines of code. This is the first problem we bit off a few months ago. Uh, explain highlighted li lines of code is a little, uh, works a little something like this. This is a screenshot of VS Code, the programming environment, free and open source that our students use and lots of people online. Here's some code written in an older language called C. And suppose that students have downloaded this or we've given it to them and they don't understand one or more lines of those code. They can highlight those lines. They can right click, thanks to one of CS50's own extensions or plugins. Select explain highlighted code, roughly there in the middle, and voila they get a chat GPT-like explanation of what that code is, even if we humans have never seen precisely that code before, and if no human is even awake at that hour to answer that question. So it's akin, if you will, to just copying and pasting code like that into chat GPT, but it keeps students in situ in our own environment, and it also, as you'll see, tries to explain it in introductory terms, not necessarily as an industry professional might like it explained, but a student who's been programming for one or just two weeks. Advising students on how to improve their code style, the formatting or the aesthetics thereof. So here's another darker screenshot here where this code, let me just stipulate, especially for the non-programmers, this is kind of messy. It's all flush to the left. It's not nicely indented. So if a student were to now click a button at top right that says style 50, the moniker we use for improving code style, you'll see rather dimly on this screen that there's some green text that's been, uh, some green shadowing that's been added to say, add white space here, hit tab, hit the space bar, hit the enter key or the like, but moreover at top right is there in for explain changes where they can similarly get a ChatGPT-like explanation of what they should change if not why as well. So that they're not just doing a clicking a button in auto formatting as they will eventually in higher level classes in the real world, but again we're sort of introducing them to the muscle memory that we want them to develop.
This one, I dare say, is the one that's perhaps most generalizable to fields well beyond CS. So trying to answer most of students' questions in the context of not a physical classroom, but a virtual one, even for on-campus students that have some kind of online Q&A discussion forum or whatever software you're using, we use something called Ed. Another one that's popular is uh, Piazza, Blackboard, and similar all have their own equivalents of online Q&A platforms. And <laughs> um, here's a little something like. So we rolled out an integration into this third-party Q&A tool this summer, whereby as soon as a student asks a question and hits enter, their uh, platform sends the question to our server, where we've written some of our own code on top of OpenAI's own platform. We talk to OpenAI's APIs, application programming interfaces, hooks that you can use to leverage their services and their model, so to speak. And then the student, within a few seconds, gets back an automated response. And that response to a simple definitional question like this is fairly straightforward. This is kind of a softball question. And even if unfamiliar, let me just stipulate that Flask is indeed a it is indeed a uh, micro framework dot dot dot. But you would expect Bing and Google a year ago, not to mention 10 years ago, to be able to answer definitional questions like this. So more interesting is a question like this from an actual student, though we've anonymized them as John Harvard as well. Let me just stipulate for the non-programmers, this is a pretty sophisticated question. The student even included some code or an error message that's fairly arcane in there. And the last question they ask is, is there a more efficient way to write this code? Which itself is a pretty broad question. But I dare say that the tool's response in this case, built on top of these APIs, is pretty darn nuanced. And in fact, this is just one of the questions that we humans endorse at top right. So this same tool, independent of us, lets a human say, yes, I like this answer. And so we hijack that mechanism to say, yes, we like this AI-based answer to signal to students that they can, at any hour, trust this answer, even if no human has actually chimed in with English. But we've at least clicked the button to signal as much that this is, in fact, a good answer. Um, this was one of my favorite responses from a human student in response to the robot, or the duck in this case, which, again, we virtualized via this platform. Um, so another mechanism, helping students find bugs or mistakes in their code via TA-like rhetorical questions. Here too, the goal, as a, any good teacher would ideally do, is not just answer all of students' questions and tell them what to do or what to fix, but to sort of guide them to that kind of solution. And so we have this larger interface, similar to going to ChatGPT itself, via which students can ask questions like this in the middle. My code is not working as expected. Any ideas? That's about as specific as many students tend to get, even with us humans. But even these tools do a pretty darn good job at analyzing the code, inferring what's actually gone wrong, especially in intro classes where these are common mistakes and frequently asked questions. And for our purposes today, let me stipulate that this is a good and correct answer. That said, the first thing students always see from DDB, the duck debugger, at top is just a disclaimer that I do think we'll eventually get rid of, but that we encourage students nonetheless to always think critically, and especially if they're asking questions that see whose answers seem a little suspect, they might indeed be inaccurate. But that's indeed been a corner case and not a common case for us. So if unfamiliar with how writing software that uses uh, Azure services, OpenAI, and other platforms, you typically right now in 2023 feed these uh, models a prompt of some sort, where English which where you give the, the AI personality, if you will. And we have literally given it a personality of a rubber duck, but a friendly and supportive teaching assistant for CS50 that answers students' questions about CS50 in the field of computer science, do not under, uh, answer questions about unrelated topics, do not provide full answers to problem sets, as this would violate academic honesty. So this is a bit of a hack, the, the way the world is using prompt engineering in this way to sort of just tell the software to do something and then hope that it does. But it does, as of now, work pretty darn well. And I think this kind of technique is only going to get more robust over time. Explaining now arcane error messages. In the world of programming, um, it turns out that when you run commands, you very often get cryptic response. That's no big deal for a seasoned industry professional, but for green students, very much so. And so what we're about to release for students this fall is another tool that when just something goes wrong, they don't even necessarily have to ask the AI about it. We can sort of detect that something went wrong in the command line, returning a non-zero exit status for those, for those familiar, and invite the duck to sort of help them along the way. Here, too, trying to chip away at the volume of frequently asked questions. And now is where, in our final three bullets, things get a little more aspirational for the coming months and if not the coming years. Assessing the design of programs and providing qualitative feedback. We've indeed automated 
correctness with check 50. We've automated style with style 50. And we've always dreamed, frankly, for years of having a design 50 tool that provides students with more subjective, qualitative assessment of their code. Like, yes, this works, and yes, it looks pretty, but you can do better. Sort of like in an English essay making a stronger argument, even if grammatically everything looks rock solid. So we're close to this now because we also have years of data, uh, assignments that have been submitted by students that have already been assessed by humans, data that we can now use to train these kinds of models. And our hope, frankly, is to next chip away at the most time intensive use of our TA's time on campus, which is grading and providing uh, long form comments, which might take three to six hours of their human time per week when we know empirically from instrumenting tools, students spend zero to 14 seconds consuming and reading that same feedback. And it's always been out of skew, but it's been a missed opportunity until I dare say now. We hope to generalize a lot of what we're doing, not just to other CS courses, but to other non-CS, non-STEM courses and faculty as well, by enabling them to sort of fine tune, so to speak, our own tools on top of Azure and on top of OpenAI, so that it's a little more turnkey for people who are not computer scientists and a little less technical, who just want to embrace AI in some positive way. And then ultimately, too, I think this is the thing we're really thinking about and wondering about is what this means for assessment. Because we've seen empirically over the past 10 years that our students, independent of higher education grade inflation, our grades have been going up and up and up because of these tools like Check 50 and Style 50, logically, because they're getting iterative feedback throughout the week before they submit. And we conjecture that as soon as we provide students with a Design 50-like tool that provides them with even more subjective feedback along the way, it stands to reason that by the time they submit at midnight on a Sunday evening, their code really should be in really good shape. After all, what was the point of all of these tools otherwise. And so in my mind, that calls into question, well, what is it that we are then assessing? Do we bring back sort of yesteryear's traditional exams, timed exams, which too we've moved away from, and sort of the arbitrary um, sort of constraints that those provide on students? And so we're thinking quite a bit about, about what this means for grades, what it is we want to assess. And for this, I don't have an answer just yet, but it's the kind of question that this is now inviting, not necessarily a worrisome one um, if at the end of the day these tools are enabling learning all the more effectively, but it's certainly a side effect of what we're seeing already. So if you'd like to play with, if you're more of a computer uh, scientist type programmer person, you're welcome to use any of these tools. CS50.dev is our entry point to that tool I called VS Code that has our extensions baked in automatically. CS50.ai is the full browser version, the conversational version of the same tool that you can ask questions about at the moment, just CS50, but eventually we do think other courses as well. And I thought I'd end with just a few quotes from students that they blessed by sharing anonymously from our most recent summer school offering. Here's one from a student, the duck was great, and I wish other classes had such a tool. This one was even more nuanced. Felt like having a personal tutor. I love how AI bots will answer questions without ego and without judgment, generally entertaining even the stupidest of questions without treating them like they're stupid. It has an, and as one could expect, an inhuman level of patience. And then lastly, love, love, loved duck, we are friends now. So uh, for all that and more, for these slides in particular, feel free to scan that URL. And I think we have a couple of minutes remaining for any questions. But thank you so much for coming.